Next up is Analia Atkinson. She first took inner light consciousness in January 1976, strengthening her connection with source and her healing abilities. She became an ILC guide that, that fall and a fellowship of the inner light minister in 1988. She and her husband Joshua created a residential spiritual community outside of Asheville, North Carolina, and invited the community to their weekly healing program using eclectic techniques. Analia practices intuitive healing, Reiki, healing touch, and healing touch. She presents teachings on the Course of Miracles and of Hona principles. Analia is the creator of the Fellowship Game, a unique adventure in spiritual growth. She and her husband Joshua now live in Hawaii. Please help me welcome Analia Atkinson. Okay. I cannot tell you how much, just like everyone has said, I cannot tell you how much I love seeing my dear old friends and the friends that they bring that I don't know, that I intend to meet. Um, I also, I proceeded, I had two things I was going to talk about. One is Paul Solomon. I have Paul Solomon stories. You know, some of these things you don't want them to die, you know, and then, um, then I also will be talking about the course. But I had to write down all the Paul Solomon stuff. So I'll start with that first. And also I have to say, I, I think I need to up, upgrade my, um, that bio because I'm not doing the HUNA anymore and I've really gotten into conflict resolution. I was actually running a, the um, Kauai Center for Mediation for the state of Hawaii for several years, and that um, was very important. To every case that went into district court or regular court was mediated first by our mediators. So they counted on us. It was it was cool. You know, it's really nice to be a peacemaker. And they were volunteers. The director got paid. I got paid. But our these were people who volunteered and gave hours at a time to just help people resolve their issues. That's true giving. That's true giving. Okay, so um, I want to tell you how I came quickly to the fellowship. When I, I was a flight attendant for, for Pan American, and yet I had already had a degree in elementary and early secondary English, and I wanted to keep teaching. And to keep your certification going, you had to get a master's degree in five years. So I flew. <laughs> I flew for three, or two and a half. And then I uh, ended up going on a cross-country trip to see the world, and then I got my master's degree at William & Mary. It was the first time in my life I'd ever lived alone, and I loved it. I'd always shared a room with somebody. I was the oldest of four kids, etc. And I got into, um, well, I learned to become a special ed teacher, so that was one thing, and two practice sessions. But they had a library at Virginia Beach, and I had joined in New York City. They, didn't, they don't have it now, but there was a satellite for the ARE. And so I could go and get books there and um, peruse things. And um, anyway, so I came down. And when I quit flying, I spent a month at the Marshalls. And I absorbed what I could. You know, I, and I had done transcendental meditation while I was a stewardess. Tried to meditate on the airplane. <laughs> that was hard. But anyway. <laughs> um, so I had this spiritual thing, and I was getting led to the White Brotherhood. And I ended up going right from teaching to a job in Chesapeake. And I finally had like time off over, I think it was like the Christmas holiday or something like that. And I was told, I came, I went to the area, and they said, if you like that, you should go to the Fellowship of the Inner Light. There's a man who's doing what Edgar Casey did, and it's really cool. I'm like, okay, I'll go. And I came, and that day, they said, now Paul is going to be doing a five-night series on the, fellowship, uh, on the White Brotherhood at, I guess, some motel 
I, it was some motel room. And every night while I was teaching, I would drive from Chesapeake, I would come down and, and get that and was studying that. And that was really important to me. And I never left. You know, I stayed here. And then I, after I did that, I took ILC and I liked that and I took it again. And then I became an ILC guide. And, and anyway, um, so, I, and I met my uh, husband, Greg, in an ILC class. And Paul thought it was so cute. He would give us pet names, you know, some of you. And so he was um, Wegg and I was grungy. We were Wegg and grungy, you know, and that was okay. Um, I was okay, I knew it was one. And then he actually married us at a um, uh, sunrise on the ocean, right across from the Marshalls, really. And then one day he was giving a lesson on the Essenes being the pregnant ones, and he looked right at me. <laughs> and I'm like, am I pregnant? <laughs> and I was. <laughs> he could see it before I had any clue, really, you know? So I, I, these are just interesting stories that you might want to remember. Um, so then I thought about a name. I didn't know if it was going to be a girl or a boy, but if it was a boy, I loved the name Matthew because it means gift of God. And I just absolutely thought that was so great. And I said, Paul, I don't know what to name him for a middle name. He said, let his middle name be Matthew and his first name be Paul. And so he became Paul Matthew. And, but I called him Matthew. And I called him Matthew because that was a beautiful name for me until he went to school and then it's Paul Matthew and then so he became Paul again. But anyway, that was how I gave him my son's name. Um, okay, you gave all my, oh. I've, so I forgot to share, at one point, you know how we talked about putting everything on the altar? Well, I don't know what was going on in the fellowship. I emptied my savings account. This is even when I was pregnant. I, I knew that God was going to take care of me. Well, it turned out I had to have a C-section. And that was going to be big bucks. And when we went to pay, the fellowship had paid for it. And it says, because I had given that it all came back to me. So you, know, you just don't forget those things. It's, it's a beautiful, loving thing. Um, so then the next, uh, oh, no, I guess what happened next was that um, Paul was a year old and uh, my son Paul, Matthew, was a year old and Paul Solomon um, took a bunch of us to Findhorn to help him teach ILC and represent the fellowship and connect with the people there. And my ex connected with a single woman over there and had an affair. And I, you know, I'm like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what do I do now? You know, and I came back and I, I, I didn't know what to do. You know, I just didn't know what to do. And in the meantime, I had a single, I was like, had the care of my son and then I guess I better get a job and you know it was like really kind of a hard time but I would still bring the baby and go to the Chela meetings and then one night he was talking about self-love and I asked him a question and I don't even remember what the question was but what I had a most unusual experience Paul locked into me. And I don't remember what he said, but he, I just felt this energy, you know, radiating from him and going into my body and sharing, you know, that, that I, I just was lifted. And from that, his answer was the first self-love tape that the fellowship, you know, had and shared and gave out. And Russell Robertson, who was a good friend of mine, said, come on, Analia, let's go to the Jewish mother. Let, let, 
Greg take care of Matthew tonight and give him a bottle and everything. So I was like, yeah, let's have some fun. Solomon would have liked that. Anyway, <laughs> so, so that, that was all of a sudden a lift and I, my energy changed and I got a good job and um, then Greg wanted um, a, a divorce. Oh, then he had another affair with someone in Texas and so I'm like, yeah, well, I think we're done. Um, you know, and I went to Paul. I said, let's try counseling, see what happens. And Greg is like, not interested, not interested. And I'm like, oh, God. I think I shared with some of you in the gathering, my mantra growing up was, you're not good enough. Right? My mother, I always tried. I was the oldest child. But I somehow was just not good enough. So I'm thinking, well, I just, I guess I wasn't good enough, you know. And then I was pretty, I watched my emotions kind of change. Because at first I was sad, you know, I was really sad, you know, because I didn't want to be a single mother with a child and I wanted my son to have a father figure. And, I, and then I got angry, you know, hey, what's this? You hear about commitments and honesty and I guess that doesn't matter to you, especially little sidebar. Uh, when I was living in Carmelita House, I, I ended up going up with the fellowship. They all moved in spite of the fact that I was not going to be able to live on the community because I was a single mother with a child and that would be a drain on the community. But, oh yeah, but that's okay because my mother bought me a house, it was like $34,000 or something. That's pretty cheap up there, you know? And I rented out rooms, and, and Sarah lived in the room for a while, and Joshua lived in the room for a while, and Suni, you, you cleaned out the whole back room. It was beautiful, I was, you had more energy, and I had gotten on my hands and knees and cleaned the floor and shellacked it, and, and you know, rebuilt Carmelita House. And people from, the, from, from Carmel would come and we'd have our Halloween parties and parties and it was really happy. Um, so it worked out okay, but, but anyway, so I didn't always feel happy. You know, I was like, oh, what's wrong? And it was Bri Bear, where is he? Brian Berry, there he is. I said, Brian, I got to talk to you because he was really good at talking the nine step emotions. And, you know, I said, I need some help with my emotions. And this is another thing that's so, <laughs> that's so precious about all of us. We're all such resources. You know, the Course in Miracles says a miracle happens when someone who temporarily has more gives to someone who temporarily has less. We've all been given all that is, but as we're learning to undo our perceptions, and I'll get to that, we're undoing, you know, so we can see truly. We may need help from someone else, you know? We, we come together, we help them, then we may need help. So I went to Brian and he said one thing to me, Analia, the only truth that you know is is that Greg doesn't want to be married to you anymore. That's the only thing. And I'm like, right. <laughs> That's the, and I, and you know, it wasn't that easy living with someone who was, you know, having affairs and really didn't care for you. And I, I felt like little who, in Whoville, or, or the Grinch whose heart grew nine times in, in, in a day. But anyway, I got it. And all of a sudden, I started taking care of my, myself a little bit more. And I started doing more fun things and we're going. And then I fell in love with Joshua, you know. And he actually moved into my house as a renter, you know. And I'm, it's like you get what you need. So... It, <laughs> Right? <laughs> so I'm so glad that I sold him books nicely. <laughs> he remembered me. But anyway, so in this, at one point, I had counseled Paul. And all Paul said was, is let him go. That's what he said to me. That's why I went to Brian later, but let him go. And the truth is that there would have been no choice other than that. There would have been nothing that would have happened. 
made Greg happy and probably nothing that would have made me happy. But I felt like, well, you're taking his side, you know. You're just letting him, again, because he's a guy and I'm a girl and, you know, that kind of thing. But anyway, it, it worked out really well. And then, um, let me see. Oh, okay, so he counseled me and I said, so I got back on my feet. I, and, and actually, I ended up helping the kids. And people who worked in the garden stayed at my house. And I had a garden and Joshua helped me work in the garden. And at one point, after um, uh, help, Acacia, what's it, Chad? Uh, no. Yes. Um, after he left, then it was like we brought food to Carmel, <laughs> you know, to, to, the, to the big house. And anyway, so it was really good there. And then, so one time I was asking Paul a question about something else, and maybe he was like kind of tired or something, but, um, you know, I asked this question, and I was looking at him, and all of a sudden I saw a black bubble go right up off of his head instead of a white light, you know, or something like that. And I went, and I looked at it, and he saw that I saw that. And all of a sudden, his energy changed. You know, he's like, oh, I guess I need to be more careful of, of how I'm thinking. Like, like Bri was just saying, you know. Let me tuck that thought in, and let's get back to the task at hand. And so he was able to help me, and, and it worked out well. But pay attention to what's going on over people's heads. Sometimes you see the lights. You'll see the lights pop off, and sometimes you'll see other things. And so anyway, so I wanted to share that with you. And um, something he did that I thought was funny one time, I was, we were at a party. And I was talking to him, and I, th I think he got tired of talking to me because he says, oh, Analia, look over there. I think that plant needs watering. And I'm like, really? <laughs> because I love plants, and he knew that. And you know how, was it you, Brian, who talked about diversion? Yes. Oh, no, maybe it, was, it, maybe it was John Christian. When somebody starts going down a negative road, try to divert them. But I wasn't being negative with Paul. I want you to know that. But he was just bored, you know, with me. So and I get that, you know. Um, and so then, several years later, when Paul saw me happy with Joshua and things were really well, he kind of took me aside one time and he said, "See, you're happy now. And all that angst that you had when Greg left you was for nothing." So that, so I, I learned from that, you know, and I think that a lot has allowed me to be more accepting of things that come into my life. And I just wanted to share that uh, with you guys because you don't have to fight it tooth and nail. You know, you can say, and this, this is where, I, the Course in Miracles, I gotta take this off, sorry. <laughs> Where the Course in Miracles has helped me so much is it teaches me, hi Molly, how much we are loved. <laughs> it says you can't even imagine it. There is nothing in this world that compares with how God loves you. And how many of you have studied near-death experiences, just read about what people, yeah, right? And don't they always say that? I didn't want to come back. It felt so good there. I felt so loved. I felt so embraced. And, and so we always have that to look forward to. But, you know, we can also have it as we walk here. The Course in Miracles says, nothing real can be threatened, and nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. Now, I'm like, you're saying that right in the beginning of the book, and that's going to turn off maybe 50% of people because nothing real can be threatened. And people go, are you kidding? You know, this happened to me, and this happened, and blah, 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 blah. 
Which you did it happen to? The spirit you? Nope. We are as God created us. We will always be in the image, the likeness, the love of God. We cannot change that. That was like the story of Job, but also the story of the prodigal son. Right? You've got this son, and he goes to his father, and he says, you know, I don't want to be here anymore. Can you just give me my inheritance and let me go? Of course, if that's what you want. I love you. And so he divides his inheritance. He gives it to the son. Son doesn't know anything about the world. He just... He goes and he doesn't know about saving, he just spends his money and he drinks and he parties and he has nothing left after a short amount of time. And he gets kind of a job at a farmer's place feeding slops to the hogs. And it's a mess and he goes, I should go back to my father's house. Even the servants are treated better than this. And so he goes back to his father's house. And on the way, the father sees him. I'm going to get chicken skin. I am. Uh, the father sees him. And he's like, my son is coming home. The son is coming home. Kill the fatted calf. My son is returning home. And, you know, he comes home. And the son is like, you don't know what yeah, I've done. I love you. I love you, you know, I'm so glad you're here. And that's the way it is. What did the father see? He saw his beloved son. He didn't see all the messing slops with the pigs or with the, everything else. He saw his spirit, he saw his love, he knew his soul, he remembered his being a baby. Of course, it was hard for the older brother, right? The older brother said, hey, dad, you know, the guy messed up, and you're completely forgiving him. And he said, my son, you have been with me always, and I cherish you. But your, your brother has returned, and now he's one with us. It's a pretty good analogy of that we all go to heaven. The Course in Miracles says there is no hell. That's the reason I left the Presbyterian Church when I was 14. Not physically, because, you know, I ended up teaching Sunday school to the little kindergarten kids. But I really couldn't believe if, if, if Jesus said the one commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and your neighbor as yourself. And forgive your brothers, right? We're expected to forgive our brothers. How many times are we expected to forgive our brothers? You know? Seventy times seven. That's 490 times we're expected to forgive one brother for one mistake, okay? That's a lot. That's, that's kind of like, I'm sorry, I'm too busy reading the Bihas. I can't forgive. But anyway, um, so what would happen is like, so God, I made a mistake, and you're gonna send me to a place of eternal pain and damnation, and you want me to forgive someone? There's some mistranslation. I, I read a lot, and I love the Bible, but I, that's just gotta be some mistranslation somehow. Um, Cause it just really doesn't compute, and the, and the Course says that. It says, there is no hell. The Son of God is free. So we don't need to have guilt. There is a quotation about how we're expected to come to this plane to learn. We come with ideas. We, we talked yesterday about we created our our birth parents and where we were born and all the things that we wanted and we've created lives for ourselves and we go on and we create, create, create. And I guess like he's saying, well, everything, there's a season for it, you know? And then it's like, hmm, there must be something more. 
The, and then whatever it is that gets us to that, that starts the journey. Now, the journey of A Course in Miracles started at uh, Columbia University, Columbia Presbyterian University psychology department. There were professors up there that were squabbling amongst each other. You know, one of them was gay, one of them didn't like it, one of them was a Jewish atheist. I, I mean, and they just would like get with each other and it was really hard. And then one day, William Thetford said, there must be a better way. And Helen Shookman said, yes, there is, and I will join with you to help find it. And a few days later, Jesus started dictating the Course in Miracles to her. The atheist is now channeling Jesus, right? She was raised a Jew. She's channeling Jesus. And oh my God, so she goes to the other guy and said, look, I don't know about this. You, you'd read this, you know? And the, one of the first things said, you know, this is a required course. You know, you will have to, at some point, confront your holiness. Remember your holiness. Remember that you are love and you never run out of it. You can give it all away. Ha ha, no you can't. <laughs> it's right there still. And so he, uh, so she did it in, in uh, um, shorthand and she read it to him and he'd type it out and he goes, you know, this is pretty good. Uh, I, I like this. Let's keep going with this. Seven years later, it was done and they took it to the ARE. You know, and it's still there called the Urtex, you know, and so isn't that the one that's the Urtex? Yeah, because now there's like versions of A Course in Miracles, but that's the one with all of the editing because because Kenneth Wapnick came in and he took out some of the things that were just for Helen and um, William. S but then they're like, no, that could be for somebody. Let's keep that in. And so now that's going. So it's all right. But anyway, seven years later, that came. And it started with the text. And that was hundreds of words and everything. Whew, she was so glad. And then he's back. And now lesson one. <laughs> there are 365 lessons in A Course in Miracles. Actually, it's 360, but the last one you do five times. You know, you do it, this, this year it was six because it was a leap year. So we did that. And um, so this whole beautiful book came about from conflict as an answer to how we resolve conflict. And what it did in some places is that it, it corrected some of the misunderstandings. You know, like one of the things was, um, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And then, you know, so if you, you, you read that, it's like, yeah. But then it says, what that means is, give it to me. I know what to do with anger. Give it to the Holy Spirit. I can dissipate that for you. And the, we're told that the Holy Spirit, anything that you have that is troubling you, anything. We have the inner teacher, we know that. If you, if you take an ILC, you know you have a God self, right? Now the Holy Spirit, when when God created us all as one, and there is only one God, we're all still part of that God. But with our minds, because God made us creators, right? We created like our own little orbs of light. Paul called them sparks of light, right? And we started creating our own worlds. And your own world has gotten you to right where you are right now. You can't blame anybody for that. You created it. You can change it. And sometimes people were radically wrong, 
and radically want to change. And it's like, I can't, there's too much guilt. I, I can't, I'll never, I'll never make it. And it's like, that's still illusion. That happened in your illusory world. You think that happened. And the Holy Spirit takes, at our moment of death, takes all the negativity, keeps it on earth, keeps it in the illusion. Just, it, just, it goes away without you, because nobody's feeding that anymore. So that's gone. And you get to go with all the love, all the progress in love that you made, all the joy, all the fun, all the goodness, all the sharing, the extension of that love, growing that love by telling somebody, by loving somebody, and then they tell somebody. And that's how it just keeps going. You know, it goes forever. So we really have no, let, let me see. If I can remember it, um, I must have decided, oh, and I, I got a tape of Marianne Williamson for, I think it was 2018, it was a New Year's Eve celebration that she did, and she spent the whole time having people letting go. Let go of what you have. You don't want to take that into the new year. No, you want to go clean and free. And the quotation is, and if I stumble, somebody help me, I must have decided wrongly. This is what you're saying to the Holy Spirit. I'm, or yourself. I must have decided wrongly because I'm not at peace. I made that decision myself, be responsible for it, but I can decide otherwise. I choose to decide otherwise because I want to be at peace. I will give this to the Holy Spirit who will undo. Oh, I do not need to feel guilty because I will give this to the Holy Spirit who will undo all the consequences of my wrong decision. And I choose to do this. Trust that. And I have found that things that have gone wrong with people, they do this exercise and the other person forgets it, they don't remember it, or, or they recognize their part in it, you know, and it works. So you don't need to be guilty. You get to express your love. And I think Joshua said this earlier and I wanna say it again. Everything that we do is either an expression of love or a call for love. And if somebody's bumping into you because they want your attention, they want your love. They don't need you to correct them. They don't need you to gossip about it. They want your love. And when you give it to them, this is what happens. It gets easier and easier to do this. It gets easier to say, ah, okay, they need my love. You know, they don't want to be hurting. I don't want them to be hurting. And it says you eventually get to the point. And this was also in a lecture that Paul Solomon gave about the sixth terrace. Eventually, you see how you can make them feel better before they even have to ask for it. And you understand the other thing, another thing is that which I give to someone, I'm giving to myself. If I'm giving you love, I get it. They have shown that when people, they've measured it, when people do a kind act, oxytocin and pitocin or something like that, dop dopamine are triggered in your body and you actually feel better. You actually feel better by being kind. So, am I done? When do I finish? I still have 10 more minutes. Okay, so, Joshua. 
Oh yes. Oh, okay. So the story about how the how um, the Course in Miracles came to the fellowship was, um, I think it was, it was after the forty days because it was in July. I think it was a July experience of seventy-seven, and my son was born in April of 77, and I had the babies. Well, Paul went to some conference in California, and he connected up with Jerry Jampolsky, and she was Judy Scutch at that time, and they showed him A Course in Miracles, and he got it. He said, this is really wonderful. And in fact, I don't know the amount of money. Do you, Sharon? Okay, well, okay, but he, but he also helped. Yeah, jo who? Paul got Judith Scotch to Gerald Jampolsky and brought the manual here, but but he paid to help get the big dark blue, because they had it on a flimsy little cheap book, and, and they wanted to get the beautiful um, like navy blue volume that we had forever until we got the onion skin Bible one. And, and then he came anyway, it was July 77 with that book, and Paul had us all buy it. <laughs> So it was like twenty-eight dollars for the for the workbook and the text and the manual, and now of course they were all in one. But so Paul actually had a part in getting that into the world and certainly getting to us. So I think that's, and I feel like that affected him. And Joshua told me that he and Barbara Buckley and Stuart Dean. And Aaron Paul and maybe a couple at lunchtime read the Course in Miracles every day. Tara had bhakti in the afternoon and he did Course in Miracles and he taught it in the um, the servants classes and so it became a part of the fellowship of the inner light. And um, I have I guess I just want you to know that it's not something that. I keep wanting to talk about every time because I think it's so amazing. It's because it's a part of us. And I think it's a huge part of us. It's To me, it's like Jesus 2.0. You know, it's like an upgrade in what he's saying. Nothing real can be threatened. So your spirit, nothing can touch it. He won't let that. That was the lesson of Job. You cannot touch his soul. That is mine. You know, and then the prodigal son. Come on, I love you. So, time for a question, I guess? I have five minutes. Carol. Carol Steinberg wants you to know that the Course in Miracles went to the Psychical Research Foundation and they all read it to see if it had validity and they all agreed that it did. Nanette. I read the course a long time ago when it first came out, and I thought it was wonderful on uh, forgiveness, especially, and also elucidating some of the ideas in the Bible. However, having been a student of the Bible, and particularly reading the pre King James versions in the Syriac Bible, the Armenian Bibles, the Coptic Bibles, and so forth, it was clear that the things that Jesus said concerning heaven and hell were indeed in all the Bibles, including those before the King James Version, such as denouncing the Pharisees and Sadducees, telling them they wouldn't enter heaven and they were blocking others from doing it, they were sons of the devil and so forth and so on. And the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So to unpack this, um, some of my students were 
Course in Miracles original study group members. And they were complaining that the authors of the books, they were complaining that they were all having problems in their lives, their families, everything. So I went on a search to discover why the ARE and the KC readings are clear that there is no eternal hell, in my opinion, but there are places in the spiritual world where we can go in a place of regret until we realize that we need to not only repent, but determine never to make that selfish mistake again. And the same thing with heaven. So um, Dr. Harmon Bro wrote a letter who was the PhD theologian who knew Casey and wrote a letter to the ARE. It's been published. I have copies. It was in Venture Inward, comparing every aspect of the course to the Bible and to the Casey readings. And in fact, Kenneth Watnick, also the author of many of the books on the subject, uh, agreed with Dr. Harmon Bro that on those issues, the Bible and the Casey readings are diametrically opposed. So I wanted your comment on did Paul Solomon ever say prior to that or after that there is no heaven and no hell, whether it's eternal, temporary, or not at all. In other words, no accountability when you cross over. I have no recall of Paul ever saying that, but maybe Sharon does. You want to come up? I'm done. No, I just want one last thing, okay? If you love one another and your God and yourself, you're, you're going to go where you need to go, you know, which is heaven. You'll go to heaven. And, you know, the Old Testament did not talk about hell. They talked about Sheol. Sheol was a quiet place. You know, I could maybe accept that. If somebody could not repent, if somebody made mistakes, they could go to like, like a, kind of like a flat grave, kind of, because, because you're giving someone a time out. If you've made your child and the kingdom of heaven is within, and you've taken away all the distractions of the world, all the ego playthings and whatever, they're going to find that. They're going to find that. And then they can go to heaven. I believe that they would repent. But Sharon, you, you say yours, and I still think it's important to forgive. Um, I, I can find the reading later that talks about hell, because I don't recall exactly what it says. But I do know that Paul said, or I believe the call, my memory says, that Paul said, there can be, uh, that a soul has gone so much to the dark side that it, instead of um, continuing life, it would be dissipated into energy so that it can reform in a new form and that it wouldn't, it wouldn't continue its incarnations. 